So allow me to introduce myself. My name is Bree Lohman. I am a PhD candidate at the Institute for the History and Philosophy of Science and Technology. Uh, and it is my pleasure to present on work uh, that I've been conducting over the summer. Uh, I was actually able to get to the archives, uh, which is no simple feat uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and I have a few people to thank for that. Uh, first, I wanna thank uh, Elizabeth and Emerson Pugue uh, for their generosity in supporting a fellowship at the IEEE History Center. In addition, uh, I would not have been able to uh, compile this presentation or write this chapter without the guidance, the counsel, and uh, the generosity of the IEEE History Center. So thank you, Alex, in particular. Thank you, Michael. Thank you to everyone else at the IEEE History Center. Uh, what they do is phenomenal, and I encourage them, I encourage you uh, to uh, give them a search. Now, uh, I, along with my colleague, colleague uh, Atta Heshmati, are also the graduate student workshop coordinators for the academic year. Uh, and so this workshop uh, kicks off the series for 2021-2022. Uh, and it's a special one, not only because I get to share uh, with you all research I conducted over the summer, but in addition, it's held in conjunction or association with the IEEE History Center and uh, the Mercurian Working Group, uh, which belongs to the Society for the History of Technology. Um, now, it is customary uh, at University of Toronto Talks to begin with the land acknowledgement, so I would like to start here. Uh, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates for thousands of years has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still a home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have this opportunity to work on this land. Uh, scholars at the University of Toronto have criticized the phrasing of uh, that last uh, part of the land acknowledgement. To have the opportunity uh, to work on this land, this is not the logic of settler colonialism. At any rate, I was curious in thinking about uh, see acknowledgments because the historical episodes I will be looking at take place in the contested sovereignties uh, of international waters 80 miles east of the New Jersey coastline. So uh, without further ado, uh, we will begin. So this is the outline of the talk. Uh, I will be speaking for about 30 minutes, but I can make no guarantees that I will uh, stick to that. I will do my best. Um, I'm going to contextualize uh, my dissertation project, and I'm going to examine two storms that occurred uh, and were experienced by Texas Tower 4. Uh, then I will be examining uh, protocols and authorities and asking the question, why wasn't the tower evacuated? And what does this mean for the emergent nuclear defense system regime uh, that de developed in the frenzied years of the early Cold War? I should also state here uh, how these uh, graduate workshops operate. I will, uh, once I conclude uh, the formal presentation, uh, the floor will be open to question and answers. Uh, I understand that many of you have other obligations, and so we will have a soft close to the discussion at uh, 2 p.m. for those who uh, have obligations elsewhere. Uh, but I will remain uh, here to answer questions until 2.30. So if there are no questions, uh, let's begin. For this talk, uh, I will examine one icon within the diagram pictured here of the SAGE early warning and air defense system. What was SAGE? From 1957 to 1983, SAGE scanned the skies of North America to safeguard against nuclear attack, ostensibly. Today, SAGE is commemorated in the history of computing pantheon as the first real-time computerized system uh, that ser served as models for later systems of its ilk. However, SAGE was one part of a much larger beast. To borrow a phrase used to describe SAGE in its day, it was the electronic brain of a military industrial university Frankenstein. And while we know a good deal about this brain, uh, we know less about the monstrous body that SAGE was a part of. 
In other words, SAGE was embedded within a pre-existing and post-existing nuclear defense infrastructure that monitored and mapped nuclear risk across North America. This infrastructure was hemispheric in scale. It expanded and contracted over time, but at its height, it consisted of 23 control rooms uh, with one uh, in Canada, which I'll be writing about for another chapter, uh, 63 radar sites in the Arctic Circle, 2,000 mile long corridors of ocean radar, thousands of personnel of various rank and chevron and much else beside. SAGE was not one thing, it was many. Infrastructure, environment, machine, community, imaginary. So SAGE was vast and it spanned not only the continent but generations. Its effects were and are heterogeneous. In other words, it makes for a daunting subject for a talk, uh, let alone a dissertation. So instead of looking at SAGE in all its confounding totality, I propose to examine the parts at the expense of the sum. To return to the metaphor that I used before, to examine the body parts that made this Frankenstein. Now, I believe this approach can reveal much about uh, the nature of Cold War technologies, from the unevenness of existential risk and economic boon across North American communities and landscapes, to collisions of ideology with everyday life. And I believe it can also concretize the military industrial university complex itself, a socioeconomic structure that at higher altitudes of analysis remains perhaps only an abstraction. In this talk, I will examine specifically Texas Tower Far, Texas Tower Four. A radar station that monitored the skies for Soviet planes, the tower provided advanced warning and increased interception time in the event a nuclear war was launched against the industrial Northeast of the United States. Data collected by the tower was fed to a SAGE direction center, a forerunner of the modern data center, which processed the incoming information distinguishing uh, friendly aircraft from aerial interlopers. So in other words, Texas Tower 4 composed one peg of the North American nuclear defense system, an emergent regime of nuclear security surveillance, as I'm calling it. And though it earned its name from the oil rigs dotting the Texas Shoals, the Texas Tower was located 80 miles off the New Jersey coast. Uh, the confusion doesn't end there. Despite the four in its name, uh, it was one of the first built. Of the five planned, there were only three. Uh, so this goes to show you the tentative and uncertain uh, nature of nuclear defense in the 1950s and 60s. And unlike the other towers, number four was located further out to sea, not in solid seabed, but in uh, a sandy bottom. Its legs descended 180 feet uh, to the seabed below. So as I said earlier, uh, I will be examining two storms, uh, one that left it derelict uh, and one that left it wreckage. So let's begin. September 12th, 1960. It's too late to evacuate. Fierce Atlantic storms beat against the tower. The crew gird themselves as it lurches and twists precipitously. Several stories below, undersea metal bracework grates under the strain, steel grinding on steel. Loud reports reverberate through the structure. Gordon Phelan's men have been left behind on a tower that he believes is obsolete. Mm. This damn thing isn't worth a single minute he says to a colleague of his. Phelan captains Texas Tower 4, and it's a name I advise you to rem remember, at least for the duration of this talk. On shore, Phelan's squadron command monitors Hurricane Donna, tracking its formation and trajectory northward from Jacksonville, Florida. But unaccountably, they delay in dispatching a ship. At 7.30 a.m., a Coast Guard tug arrives and attempts to evacuate personnel with a specially designed uh, donut contraption. But with swells of 20 feet and winds of 40 knots, it's too dangerous to evacuate. The crew will have to ride out the storm. At 1 p.m. on September 12th, it descends upon them. The eye of Hurricane Donna churns. Now, the tower is built to withstand exceptional conditions. Waves of 35 feet and winds of 110 knots. Hurricane Donna exceeds the worst case scenario conditions envisaged 
by the tower's structural design engineers, certainly a fault of their own. On that day in September 1960, colossal 65 foot waves nearly submerged the structure. It stands, I should add, only 67 feet above sea level. The onboard anemograph registers wind speeds of 100 knots, the maximum it can measure. The true speed is closer to 115. Storm, wind, storm winds whip violently across the decks of the tower, ripping a radio antenna from its mounting and forcing an eight by 12 foot piece of steel to bend upwards 18 inches. Ventilators to the diesel room are smashed in as if, I quote, somebody had taken a big slammer, a big sledgehammer and knocked it in. Rivets pop from the flying bridge platform, wresting it from its fastening and causing it to careen into one of the tower legs. Two officers, a young man from Newton, Mexico and another from Boston, clutch their rosaries, fall to their knees and pray for deliverance. I, I should state here that this is all cited in sworn testimonies. At 5 p.m., the worst of Hurricane Donna passes and the shaking crew breathes a collective sigh of relief. Phelan writes in his captain's log, never again. Only it would happen again. On January 15th, 1961, another storm hit. This time Texas Tower 4 did not survive. It collapsed into the Atlantic Ocean along with the 28 lives on board. All perished, including Phelan. So much about that day in January 1961 recalled Hurricane Donna. The delayed evacuation attempt made too late. Poor communication between the tower and squadron command on shore. Structural deficiencies buckling under a storm that was worse than expected. All the while, a rescue ship beats helplessly against the waves. There are important differences, however. Though the tower performed a radar function before Hurricane Donna, afterward, it was functionally derelict. And while the safety of the tower was always in question, none could say they were unaware of the risk of keeping a crew out there after Hurricane Donna. Excuse me. As the designers of Texas Tower 4 failed to protect their own handlers, how could it be said that the nuclear defense system of which it was a part, as I've already established, could protect against an attack. The collapse of Texas Tower 4, I argue, exposed the emergent nuclear defense regime as not only unreliable, but as unsafe. Reliability, of course, is a cornerstone of nuclear defense, <clears throat> as the system must be foolproof, or it can't be said to perform the function that it's set out to do. Meanwhile, fixing the, rely or fixing the safety problem is not merely a matter of more intelligent engineering. The problem was as much one of entrenched uh, communication structures as it was one of steel bracings, pin plates, and casings. To bring this issue of fumbled communication to the foreground, I'm going to attempt to an answer one question by the end of this talk. Who had the authority to evacuate? This question, I believe, sheds light on all the others that I'm going to oppose during this talk. Now, while military authority is often understood as strictly hierarchical, processes of decision making are just as dynamic, haphazard, and tentative as in other arenas. In the case of the tower, there was anxiety about when and if to evacuate. To put it plainly, there was a fear of making the wrong call. I need to clarify one point. I'm not interested in figuring out who is to blame. That has already been decided. It was the men in charge. The colonel was tried and acquitted. The cases against the majors were dismissed and the captain lost his life. Rather, I'm interested in what is to blame. I want to know why a highly stratified organizational structure within a highly automated computational system failed to act especially when quote unquote, quick and decisive action is a logic behind nuclear defense. So let's turn then uh, to the events leading up to the collapse of Texas Tower on January 15th, 1961. January 12, 1961, three days before the collapse, 
New York City, office of J. Rich Steers, an architectural engineering firm contracted by the United States Air Force. An emergency meeting convened to discuss new breakages at the tower five days ago on January 7th, a deep sea diver surveying the tower legs noticed new ruptures and cracks. This will be important later when I come to the last section of this talk. One of the engineers says the men on the tower are in jeopardy. At that moment, there are 27 men aboard the tower. It has been partially evacuated and left to a skeleton crew. The 28th man returns from leave in two days, half for airmen, half for civilian. One of the engineers says the structural capability of the tower is reduced to 55%. Just what the engineer means by 55% is not clear to everyone in the room. Evidently what this engineer, Theodore Cuss is his name meant, is that once the necessary repairs to the damaged tower are completed, it will be 55% as strong as originally designed. Or so he explains before a Senate subcommittee hearing months later. His boss doesn't think the math adds up, the figure should be higher. Now, why am I mentioning all this? While this figure of 55% becomes important investigations afterward, solidifying into expert opinion cited by attorneys and senators, the initial confusion and agreement suggests the difficulty of appraising the strength of the compromise structure. What can it withstand? How much is too much? No one is certain at the time. However, all in attendance agree that the tower is unfit for service. Because of that, they decide to bring everyone home or at least the civilians, and pickle the tower by February 1st, 1961. Pickle is military speak uh, for closing it down. However, they say the tower will be all right for that long. January 14th, 5.22 AM, one day before the collapse, Navy ship TAKL-17, which I'm going to be call, calling the New Bedford uh, for sake of ease, disembarks from port en route to Texas Tower 4. Is captained by Sixto Mangual. He is responsible for supplying the towers. At 5:22 a.m., the, the crew moors to the ship of, or moors the ship to one of the tower legs and discharges supplies. Over 200 tons uh, is offloaded from the tower. The ship log of the New Bedford reports good visibility. The seas are calm, ideal conditions for evacuation. Sixto Mangual radio telephones Phelan. He says, "If you're going to evacuate, do it while you still can." Phelan replies, I'm going to get in touch with the squadron. He calls Mangual back and says, we will remain on board. Interestingly, there is no record of Phelan making any calls. And it's on the same day, incidentally, uh, that the first weather advisory uh, for a storm comes in. Uh, it will be revised several times, but it's supposed to be in effect initially just for the day of January 14th, but will end up being in effect until January 16th. January 15th, around 10 a.m., Texas Tower 4, day of the collapse. A call comes in for Phelan. It's a CWO. Phelan says the storm is here. He says, we've got heavy seas, we've got winds, 40, 50, and gusts up to 60. The voice on the phone asks, well, how do you feel about the tower? Phelan says, all right, it's pretty stable. The voice on the phone persists. Are you concerned about getting off the tower? Phelan says, you know as well as I do that we can't get off now. January 15th, 10.30 AM, a loud crack thunders through the tower. Henry Schutz is on the phone. Something let go, he says. Schutz is a senior representative for J. Rich Steer at the tower, and it's his business to know what's wrong with the structure. What do you think it was, says the voice on the phone. Schutz doesn't know and he can't check because of the conditions outside. He mentions that during a lull in the storm earlier in the day, he had found a 20 inch vertical crack in the metalwork. The tower is less stable now and begins to do something it hasn't done before. That's gyrate, in excess of two feet by Schutz's uh, Schutz calculation. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, if you can mute yourself uh, for the time being. Uh, just so we don't have any further disruption. Uh, Schutz is concerned. He fears that if the wind shift, uh, the tower might give. January 15th, 3.15 PM. Conditions aboard the tower are critical. Phelan is indignant. The wind here just hit 72 knots, he says to a weather observer over the phone. Now maybe they will do something. They are his superiors. 
Colonel Banks, Major Stark, Major Shepard, and the myriad other chevrons who can authorize such an action. In their turn, they entrust Phelan to make the call himself. Each expects the other to act, no one does. Uh, finally, because he's stuck between a rock and a hard place, uh, Phelan makes the call around 4 to 5 p.m. He phones the acting squadron commander to evacuate. Uh, mind you, conditions are, are not going to permit a evacuation from tower to ship. Shepard greenlights the operation and requests helicopter evacuation from nearby bases. At Otis Air Force Base, helicopters remain grounded because of the severe weather. January 15th, sometime between 6 p.m. and 6.15 p.m. All hands are on deck. The atmosphere is frantic. Crew shield their faces from freezing sleet. They slip on the deck as they scatter cement and gravel for an emergency helicopter landing that will not be coming. Safes holding classified materials are thrown overboard. When they leave, they don't want Soviet agents aboard the nearby trawlers to retrieve any intel. The tower is gyrating in excess of five feet now. Phelan calls his wife, uh, Eleanor. He says that the tower is breaking loose. It's the last time they speak to each other. January 15th, 7.10 p.m. Phelan radio telephones Mengual on the New Bedford, that, which has been instructed uh, to stay nearby and monitor the situation. Phelan says, I think we can hold until daylight. The worst of it is over, uh, Phelan must be thinking. About 20 miles away, a Navy ship experiences a series of unusually hot, tall storm waves. The report afterwards reads, these waves shook the ship with appreciably greater force than uh, did any prior or subsequent wave action during the storm. The report adds that the ship recorded a change in wind direction of about 20 degrees just before the waves hit. This is one of the things that concerned Henry Schutz uh, earlier in the day. The author of this report speculates because of the funnel effect of in the Hudson Canyon, which is the part of the Atlantic Ocean where the tower is uh, situated, it might produce, I quote, abnormal wave patterns in vicinity of tower site. January 15th, 7.33 p.m. Aboard the new Bedford, the PIP representing the to Texas Tower 4 disappears from radar. They send out a report, assume Texas Tower 4 crashed suddenly with all crew on board. Based on the evidence we have, 27 men are on the deck when the structure rips apart and falls into the sea. The 28th man is manning the radio. January 15th, 7.45 p.m. Search and rescue operations are underway. Reports of the first hour of the search record an overpowering smell of diesel. Seven miles from the site of the tower, an empty life ring is spotted. Over the course of the night and the morning, search and rescue site mattresses, timbers, a footlocker, a quote unquote hold lifeboat, and oil slicks, but no signs of life. January 16th, 7.35 a.m. The body of Master Sergeant Troy F. Williams is recovered. He is wearing a life jacket, but the straps are improperly fastened, suggesting that there was very little forewarning, if any, before the tower collapsed. A second body without a life jacket is sighted 18 miles from the tower floating face down. As a ship approaches to recover the corpse, it sinks below the water. January 16, 10.35 a.m. A sonar operator aboard the McCaffrey, uh, which is another ship reconnoitered for search and rescue, registers what he determines to be deliberate and consistent tapping sounds originating from the wreckage of Texas Tower 4. The operator asks through Morse code sonar pulses how many are alive. The response is ambiguous. The operator suspects that someone is alive in the wreckage, possibly trapped in an air pocket. Even if part of the tower is intact, it is not airtight. The wreckage likely has not settled and will continue to shift, which may cause the remaining air pockets to disappear. So time is of the essence. However, others are skeptical of the McCaffrey operator's assessment and evaluate the sounds as random. When they finally can access, find and access the tower, uh, a diver by the name of uh, Frank Sanger uh, taps on the wreckage uh, and no replies come. Instead, they just hear the tumbling of equipment uh, resettling. 
January 19th. The second body is discovered floating in the overhead of one of the compartments the divers inspect. They service with the body in tow. And a, rep a reporter from Life magazine dispatched from the scene captures this photograph uh, pictured here of the body being pulled from the water. Uh, this image will be published in the January 27th, 1961 issue of Life magazine. Um, for the sake of time, uh, I'm going to abridge the remainder of the search and rescue efforts. Uh, but suffice it to say that from January 20th to February 15th, a map of the wreckage gradually emerges. The main structure rests at a depth of about 65 feet. Uh, and the main, uh, the A corner, excuse me, of the tower looms out at 100 feet above the ocean floor. Now on one of the last dives before the operation concludes, a team recovers a suitcase from the wreckage. Inside the suitcase, there is a small clock. Its hands are fixed at 7.28 p.m. So the question remains, who had the authority to evacuate Texas Tower 4? I'd like to return to the night of the collapse. When Eleanor Phelan learned that her husband was lost at sea, she said to the officer on the other side of the 3 a.m. phone call, my husband has been telling you for four months to get those men off the tower. I imagine the unspoken words, why didn't you do anything, hung in the air. Indeed, the tower was useless after Hurricane Donna. Don't take my word for it. Uh, take the word of the commander of the Boston Air Defense Sector. Colonel Banks, who we will be uh, speaking about for some time during this section, admitted that we were getting nothing out of it. So let's ask the question that I imagine Eleanor Phelan was thinking. Why didn't they do anything? Why didn't they evacuate Texas Tower 4? The question turns on two issues, protocols and authorities of evacuation. After Hurricane Donna, new procedures were enacted to prevent the past from repeating itself. According to the quote unquote hurricane alert and evacuation procedures for Texas Towers, the person tasked with making the evacuation was the commander of the Boston Air Defense Sector, who was instructed to order evacuation when conditions warrant. The commander in this case is the aforementioned Colonel Banks. Now, according to evacuation procedures, which are listed here, uh, it begins, uh, phase one begins upon receipt of a 72 hour notice of a storm warning. The time that concerns us is not phase two nor phase four, but phase three. Uh, this is the critical time, 24 hours prior to hurricane fall. It is the point in time when a decision, decision must be made. Uh, any later than that, sea swells will prohibit uh, a tower to ship evacuation uh, and weather conditions would be too bad uh, for uh, helicopters to safely make the trip 80 miles into the ocean. However, uh, Colonel Banks, I maintain, disregards these protocols. On January 7th, uh, the date when new ruptures and breakages were reported in the tower legs, which led to that uh, emergency meeting, which I mentioned at the start of my timeline of uh, the collapse of the tower in January. On January 7th, Banks issues blanket permission for evacuation, delegating responsibility downward or bottoming it in military lingo to Captain Phelan. Uh, so what's the problem with this? Well, it ends up being counterproductive. The evacuation orders are ambiguous, granted under no specific time, no specific conditions, no specific date. Banks does this, he explains to investigators, because he does not have the information at his fingertips. But that's not quite true. Uh, certainly, he doesn't know uh, what's happening on the day of the tower, but consultants at the engineering firm and on the tower are communicating regularly with his staff. By my reading, he contravenes this recently established protocol for hurricane evacuation, uh, which was established because of the latent delay uh, for evacuation during Hurricane Donna. The commander is tasked with making a decision, not whenever, but at the appropriate time, 24 hours in advance of the storm. 
So the problem here isn't just the ambiguous nature of the evacuation order he issues, it's how he delegates the order. What transpires from January 7th to the day of the collapse is a tragic game of telephone. While Banks delegates the authority to Phelan, he never communicates directly with the man he entrusts to make the call. Now, you may be wondering, perhaps uh, there are protocols in place in the United States Air Force uh, where you can speak to the next in charge and they speak down. Uh, however, this oversight uh, galls even the Air Force investigators tasked with determining who is at fault for the collapse of the tower. But allow me to make uh, my case stronger. Considering the unanimous opinion that the tower was unsafe by engineering consultants, the aborted evacuation attempt during Hurricane Donna, and the decision to remove personnel in February, it beggars belief that banks would not speak directly with Phelan on this matter. Instead, he just assumes. He assumes that the evacuation will take place. I wanna draw you, your attention to the language he uses in sworn testimonies. There's no question in my mind. It was a foregone conclusion. Uh, he assumed that nothing else would take place. Strikingly, uh, Banks contemplates getting off the tower on January 14th, the last opportunity that you could do this. Granted, he's not the only person at fault for this not taking place, uh, but the buck stops with him. So he contemplates getting off the tower and discusses it with staff, but doesn't move forward with the order. And so the investigators ask him, why don't you, or why didn't you? And this is what Banks says. I assume that it was automatically going to happen. Possibly I was wrong. It was wrong. I have no comment other than that. Again, uh, Colonel Banks was ultimately acquitted. So, it is all too common to view avoidable disaster as inevitable in hindsight. And yet, as I read through testimonies at Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, what shocked me was how many opportunities there were to avoid this outcome. The collapse of Texas Tower 4 was contingent upon officials waiting it out, delegating down the chain of command without following up, and responding to problems as they happened instead of addressing underlying causes. The fact of the matter is the loss of life was preventable and the Air Force helmed by men like Banks is culpable. Galling negligence in engineering design, but especially communication structure responsible for the 28 deaths. And yet that the collapse did in fact happen exposed something bigger, the inherent unsafety and unreliability of the emergent nuclear defense regime, which would re restructure uh, North American political economies. In the months after the collapse, government and military officials were forced to answer difficult questions. The Air Force declined to build a replacement after the disaster. The Senate, uh, the investigating Senate panel asked in their manner whether it was indeed an operational requirement of the service at the time of its collapse. Why, in other words, was it necessary to spend $21 million on another nuclear defense installation when it was concluded that the original tower was unnecessary, even before it fell, in other words? The tower was designed to last 20 years. Three and a half years later, it was no longer standing and long deemed unnecessary. I would like to close with uh, one postscript. If you are an experienced deep sea diver, uh, you can visit the wreckage of Texas Tower 4 today. Uh, it's about a five hour boat ride from Beach Haven, New Jersey, uh, and it lays approximately 165 to 180 feet beneath the surface of the water in the perennial near darkness of the ocean depths where uh, temperatures remain uh, sub 40. A plaque is still visible on the hull of the tower if you know where to look. It reads, ominously in retrospect, the Tower 4 story is the story of its men, their adventures, and their problems. All these men will pass on to other assignments, but they never forget the tower. So,
thank you all. And I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you, Bree. Um, I have to admit, I, I had not heard this whole story and you've done a really nice job of the almost minute by minute chronology of the actual failure of decision making and, and structures. And I guess I'm really reminded at a, at a fundamental level of Sebastian Younger's The Perfect Storm. Um, which you, you might consult uh, just as a reflection, but the consequences that come from your story, I think are a bit more significant than those of the uh, Gloucester fishermen. And I guess I'm wondering, since you're doing these micro histories of, of a couple or several locations in the Sage Air Defense System, are you finding other issues of, um, whether you call it socio-technical faults or breakdowns in the system at Colorado Springs or North Bay? Are there issues with the, the IBM mainframes or the other radar parts of the systems and the people who operate them in those communities? Well, thank you so much. And again, I just have to shout out Alex. He's been such a uh, wonderful support uh, and he's, uh, provided me with a number of uh, excellent primary source and secondary source recommendations. So thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. Um, this tells part of the story, uh, but not the whole story. Um, if there were time, I would pair this presentation with the one on North Bay, Ontario, uh, which uh, benefited uh, from the installation of uh, not only uh, Bomark missiles, which are nuclear capable warheads that were installed on Canadian, well, around Canadian soil because that, that territory belonged to the United States uh, and a, uh, the only hardened SAGE direction center. Uh, it was called the SAGE underground complex. Um, I I'm waiting to hear back from uh, the city clerk of North Bay uh, to find the exact figures, but I found a source in a newspaper uh, saying that about three fifths of the economy of North Bay in the early 1970s was supported by NORAD. Um, so that tells a very different story um, and so uh, I, I guess by only discussing Texas Towers, it does provide uh, a partially skewed representation of what uh, this emergent new, uh, political economy meant uh, for the United States. Um, but again, I think by looking at micro histories, we can, to quote myself from earlier, see the unevenness of uh, nuclear risk and nuclear benefit uh, across Canada and the United States. There were other issues um, reported, but um, for example, the Bomark missile uh, was somewhat unreliable. Uh, thank you so much, Miriam, uh, for attending. And uh, thank you as well, August. Um, but uh, finding uh, records uh, in not only the Canadian archives, but American archives is quite difficult. Uh, as I disclosed with you, uh, Alex, uh, there was a, a partial failure of a Bomark missile uh, and uh, the McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey. Um, and so I, I received some materials from the Air Force historian at that base, but they're on a CD-ROM and I've so far been unable to locate uh, a device where I can access them. Uh, there are also some incidents in Canada, but Canadian archives are uh, less open uh, than American ones, uh, just as a general rule of thumb. Um, so it's, it's a complicated story, but I mean, if I, I can provide some anecdotes of the type of issues that emerged uh, in North Bay, Ontario. Uh, there was only one re intruder reported. It happened to be a beaver, a beaver that wandered into the base and it was trapped with a trash can. I actually have images of that as well. Um, but more seriously, uh, when uh, uh, nuclear missiles were brought into North Bay, uh, the local popu population was uh, quite frantic uh, and, and uneasy about what this represented and how you know these these international geopolitical structures coming to a small community like North Bay.
Aaron, yes, thank you. I, uh, I need to make uh, the trip to the media comments. Carl. Yes, uh, Bree, thank you so much. That was really fascinating. What, a, what an interesting story. I, I, I didn't know what was going on at that time while I was peacefully living my life in Winnipeg. Um, he, hearing this kind of a story, which is all too common, sadly, always reminds me of my favorite social psychology book, which is titled Mistakes Were Made, and then in very small print, but not by me. Um, <laughs> But I, I have a, a very basic question. I know nothing about this whole field, but I, I, as I listen to the story and, and you know, the challenges and the difficulty of doing that, of, of building this structure at that time, what, what was the rationale for locating it off coast? Did it have some huge advantage over building something on land? Uh, well, it actually was meant to be gap filler uh, radar for the dew line radar. So uh, in the 1950s, uh, the Canadian North uh, was uh, highly militarized with three lines of radar, the Pine Tree, Mid-Canada, and the dew line, which was located at the very north. Um, because uh, military strategists at the time assumed that if an attack was coming uh, by way of Soviet bomber, uh, it would be coming over the Arctic Circle. Mm -hmm. um, and so to fill out uh, the radar coverage, they located it out on shore to provide a few additional minutes uh, and a few hundred miles of uh, extra coverage in oh, the event okay. uh, that Soviet bombers came from there. Uh -huh. um, now, uh, there's a few things to point out with this. Uh, in 1957, uh, Sage came online. In 1957, uh, Sputnik uh, orbited uh, the Earth on what was uh, essentially an intercontinental ballistic missile that got into orbit. So by the time that Sage was ready, like online, it was already in one sense antiquated because it could only track one type of aerial phenomenon, which was aircraft. Uh, it mm -hmm. couldn't track mo something moving faster than that. So in a sense, uh, this uh, entire infrastructure was outdated, but on the other sense, it had continuing utility. Uh, if anyone's read Paul Ceruzzi's uh, Modern History or History of Modern Computing, he discusses the afterlives of SAGE where it becomes Sabre, uh, which is uh, used by uh, civilian uh, airlines across the world. So it's a strange uh, history that I don't quite understand how it was partially obsolescence uh, and partially not. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I think you get to call that dual use technology and, and doing airline reservations as opposed to trying to do airline reservations and maybe, I don't know, steamship reservations yeah. uh, would, would be the analogy between jet aircraft and, and ICBMs. Yeah, thank you. That's a uh, good observation. Uh, R. Colburn asked in the chat, are Air Force evacuation protocols different from naval protocols uh, where the captain of a ship is typically responsible for ordering abandoned ship? Uh, I can't speak generally uh, about the question, even though I'm from Colorado Springs uh, and grew up not too far from the Air Force Academy. Um, uh, in this particular instance, there were protocols uh, just for the Texas Towers. Uh, and in the event that there was a communication breakdown and uh, the towers couldn't communicate with the shore, uh, it fell down to failing. Um, in this talk, I'm uh, somewhat forgiving of uh, Phelan for not making the evacuation decision himself, uh, but he is culpable as well for not making any moves. Uh, I had to abridge this presentation. Uh, there were also issues uh, between the intermediaries, between the Colonel and the Captain. And that's uh, Major Stark and Major Shepard, who did not communicate to one another. Um, so like I said before, it is very much a game of telephone. Uh, 
uh, and only because uh, I have access to the protocols for this particular structure uh, that I, I can speak with authority, but not beyond that. I should say there is something else I wanted to share about the Texas Towers, but uh, I didn't have uh, the time. Uh, and that's what life was like uh, aboard uh, the towers. Uh, one of my projects as a micro historian, micro historian is to examine everyday life. Um, and unfortunately, there just wasn't uh, the time in the presentation. Uh, but interestingly enough, uh, most people volunteered to be posted out there. Morale was quite high because pay was good. Uh, the food was good as well. There were daily beer rations, and I actually have some surviving uh, menus from Thanksgiving and Christmas. It seemed like uh, it was a posh assignment for some time. Uh, those who were posted there received uh, an overseas credit, which means higher pay, uh, and it also meant preferential base reassignments. Uh, that was eventually revoked, uh, causing uh, some to balk uh, that uh, they aren't being paid for overseas assignments when they're literally serving overseas. Um, but uh, there were some issues uh, that can make it quite uncomfortable. Uh, the constant motion of uh, the tower was one of them. Uh, for those who are accustomed to life on uh, a Navy ship, uh, it could be nausea induce inducing. Uh, greenhorns were advised to uh, not shave with a straight razor. Uh, the noise was incessant. They had seven diesel generators that rumbled continuously. Um, and uh, during fogs, uh, they would have to play our foghorn every 30 seconds uh, because it was on the approach uh, to uh, New York City Harbor. Uh, so it's interesting. Uh, but while morale was high, uh, that wasn't true after September 12th uh, when uh, the stability of the structure was compromised and it only got worse uh, since then. But perhaps I'll have another chance to talk more uh, about uh, what it was like aboard the tower. I see that Aaron has a question. Bree, thank you for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, so just one question of clarification. Phelan was a captain, a U.S. Air Force captain? Yes. Was that, so a captain, yeah. So in regards to the question, so Air Force captain is a different rank entirely from a naval captain. So in the Navy, a captain of a ship is usually a commander. So uh, is or 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 an actual captain. So an 06 or an 05 commander being an 05. And then the Air Force, of course, a captain is an 03. So in the Navy, we would call him um, uh, lieutenant. Um, and so to it's still a junior officer. So Phelan. Um, being a junior officer, still uh, given he's Air Force captain, may not have had the, um, either may not have had the authority to order an evacuation, um, or if he did, he's still thinking to himself, mm, still junior, I might piss off the wrong people, and I don't want to do that. Um, so, so that's just one, so a captain of a ship, so on a, I was in the Navy, right? So, uh, uh, and so the commanding officer of a ship has authority to evacuate. Um, nobody needs to tell him. Uh, in fact, indeed, he could, if he were not to evacuate under various conditions, even if he were not ordered to do so, he could still get in trouble. He or she could still get in trouble. So there, there's that going on. Um, so I have a few questions. So one, I mean, I think overall the um, the narr your narrative is that well, um, there's um, plentiful evidence to suggest that the structure was compromised and um, should after September. We said September twelfth was it, or so, so. Um, and therefore, right, given going um, because in the North Atlantic, well, mid North Atlantic, the seas get rather rough um in the in the in the winter right i can speak from experience and so the risk has gone up right for further structural damage and compromise of human life and therefore um any sensible decision making structure would have concluded that the the facility should have been the tower should have been um um evacuated be, uh, relatively soon after the, the september 12th is that your is that kind of your argument uh, yeah, somewhat in, in broad swaths, yes. 
Okay. Um, and therefore, the reason wasn't uh, because there's um, there's various expert opinions with you, just security uh, consulting, engineering consulting, and, and a few others. And that information wasn't consumed in the right way. It didn't flow up to the right authorities to make the right decision. That's also what you're claiming? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so let's imagine a very close off counterfactual scenario in which the uh, hurricane comes, or it wasn't a hurricane, it was a winter storm, right? So was it a hurricane? I don't know, it doesn't matter. No. Um, uh, and so the storm comes and goes and um, the platform uh, survives. Uh, there was planned, do you think it was planned to be evacuated uh, shortly after that storm? Does yeah, so think? I can uh, confirm, yes, it was planned to be evacuated at latest by February 1st. I see, yes, uh, yes, I remember. So this, yes. was, uh, this was made by the consultancy firm. They were going to bring their staff off, and the Air yes. Force was going to follow. Um, and then on January 14th, Colonel Banks was deci decided in his mind that it would take place, but he never confirmed. And yes. what he did bottom authority to Captain Phelan, but I... I'm of the similar mind as you that Phelan probably felt somewhat uncertain about whether or not the authority he was granted at this point seven days ago was indefinite and continuing. There's evidence yes. to point that he believed that was true and evidence to point that it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. So also my garden, my first point, a U.S. Air Force colonel is a Navy, Navy captain. That's the comparable rank colonel and captain. And so Phelan being a captain was a junior officer. I, it's just a sucky situation for him, for him I think. But um, yeah, I guess one, one worse retort would be, um, so I, I remember in the Navy, you know, the, everything we do, like uh, securing patches in certain ways, how we watertight compartments, how we construct a ship, and uh, how we do our damage control practices is always the result of blood because people have died not doing those things in the past. We've learned our lessons. Um, and it's like you mentioned this, uh, it's easy to, with hindsight, to say, oh, the risks were too high, the decisions made were, um, were uh, irresponsible. I'm, I'm just wondering, I think a, a good compliment to your argument would be any work on uh, risk assessment. Um, uh, so there, a formal risk assessment, if anything like that was made in terms of like, hey, what's the probability of a structural failure um, and what are the most likely scenarios and so forth? Um, because it's very possible that the storm could have came and went, that the tower uh, maintains and then they uh, you know, they, they proceed with the evacuations and they decommissioned the facility. And it's, you know, no historian is really interested in this scenario. Um, yeah, so anyway, that's just a, a, my general thinking. It's, um, you know, I want, I think it's right to um, criticize various decisions for being made in, in the light of overwhelming evidence to the contrary. And then there's also uh, some decisions are made when, there are competing risk assessments and decisions have to be made between which ones you're going to take and you decide to go with one and it just, you know, an improbable event happened, namely collapse. And so uh, there you go. But anyway, Bree, I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you for giving it. Uh, thank you so much, Aaron. I was uh, really looking forward to, um, uh, to what you had to say on the matter uh, because when it comes down to it, it's, I, I'm, I'm trying to interpret uh, the complex inner workings of the military. Uh, and it's a difficult task. We're almost at the top of the hour. So I wanna say thank you to everyone for joining. I will stay on, uh, but if you have other obligations, you're free to go. Uh, in it, incidentally, Aaron, um, uh, this was an inner service collaboration between the Navy and the Air Force. The Navy was responsible for uh, installing the structure uh, and the, the Senate held them culpable, uh, partially responsible. Um, and then it was turned over uh, to the Air Force. Phelan, he was actually a Navy man before he joined the Air Force, and he joined the Air Force because he was got tired of uh, life at sea. Uh, how ironic. Um, uh, he, he probably got this assignment because of his naval experience. Yeah, uh, that's honest. what I thought so too. And then Sixto Mangual, who incidentally uh, lived a very, or served a very interesting career, uh, and search for a hydrogen 
bomb that collapsed or fell into uh, the Mediterranean Ocean. Uh, yeah. I he, used to do that in the Navy. We used to look for lost things. So really? Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like thought. torpedoes, armament, aircraft, people, boats, those types of things, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, he, he served under the Navy and his task was to uh, uh, basically replenish the stocks of the Texas Tower. So. Rhee, you have one question from Petter M about what led you to investigating this particular story on the- uh, Oh, yes. Uh, Petter M, thank you so much. I apologize. Uh, so what led me to study this topic was I uh, completed some work at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. And I was there, I realized I was interested not just in uh, history, but the history of technology. And later I uh, had posts at the Computer History Museum uh, and the Living Computers Museum in Seattle. So the CHM is located in Silicon Valley. It's still open. Uh, the Living Computers Museum was a pet project of Paul Allen, now deceased, and uh, the museum is now defunct. And that's where he became interested in the history of computing. Um, and I didn't know what I wanted to study for, study for my dissertation. I was quite interested in uh, looking at SAGE more closely, in particular, looking at that diagram uh, that I shared at the beginning of this presentation. Um, and so rather than uh, conducting uh, a study of SAGE at the Institutional Center, its birthplace at MIT, radiating outward, I wanted to see what the effects of its infrastructure were. Um, and as it turns out, not many historians have done this. Uh, and there are a lot of interesting stories that are just uh, hiding in plain sight. One of them is uh, the Texas Tower. Another one is uh, this uh, closed uh, underground uh, military base in North Bay. Um, so that's what got me interested in it, you know, uh, starting with SAGE and then uh, looking at its infrastructure. Otherwise, uh, I never would have uh, spotted this story. What alerted you to the Texas Tower in particular? I mean, SAGE is obviously an enormous system. Um, well, I was... Uh, interested in uh, telling, I, I think, through the four micro, or micro histories, a what I felt to be somewhat complete history of SAGE, where I look at breakdown and I look at maintenance, as well as uh, looking at what you could call not a history of technological failure, but technological set, success in other instances. Um, and so I, I felt that it was in some ways emblematic of uh, the nature of nuclear defense infrastructure. Uh, it was a failure, a part of a system which ultimately was a failure. Um, it, if anyone's familiar with Operation Sky Shield, uh, if I have the name correctly, it was the first time, uh, or one of the first times when all planes across North American airspace were downed. It, the only time that happened again was during 9-11. Uh, um, and they were conducting a war games exercise uh, to assess uh, the readiness of uh, the nuclear defense infrastructure. And SAGE recorded a uh, an successful interception rate of uh, only 30%. Um, so, I mean, this was more expensive than the Manhattan Project and uh, it was unreliable. Um, and so I think looking at the Texas Tower is in some ways uh, looking at microcosm uh, of SAGE in general. Of course, it is an extreme case. So uh, the comparison can only go so far. Uh, Bri, thank you for, for the talk. I really enjoyed the kind of that story. I have a question regarding the, your uh, conclusion or the aftermath of the, of the event. And it was, I mean, I was, I was wondering if it's a little bit counterfactual, but if the kind of the um, those officials who were uh, investigating the kind of the cause of the this uh, event, this failure, if they uh, identify a sort identified a sort of uh, technological failure or a sort of the failure in protocols, not the failure of those. Uh, like commanders who are who, who who were supposed to follow the protocol. I mean, would you think there there would be a difference? I mean, different 
consequences in in that like uh, hype hypothesis uh, they, like that sort of assumed uh, assumed assumed uh, situation because it's uh, i mean when when we assign uh, the responsibility to to individuals it would be uh, i mean it, it there, there is a, a lots of politics behind this this kind of legal decision or criminological decision i mean what is your thought on the on on this side of the story I, I hope. yeah i mean when i was reading through the testimonies i felt that colonel banks was saying things so as to uh avoid being uh court-martialed and again it, it, he was brought before a case but um i believe the historian's name is ida kronakis and she looks at uh, a collapse of a uh, the quebec bridge at the turn of the 20th century and she examines uh two different uh, I guess, ways of conceiving uh, guilt or blame, right? A narrow attribution and a broader attribution. Um, and what I'm looking at specifically isn't just, uh, and this is something I need to clarify in my own chapter, uh, isn't just an individual, it's a, a communication structure uh, where there are manifold breakdowns. And, and to, for illustrative purposes, I focused on the individual of uh, Colonel Banks uh, but there were uh, breakdowns along the way of this game of telephone. Um, if protocols uh, had uh, been changed or had been tested before, or perhaps uh, the conclusions I would offer would be different. Uh, I don't know if these protocols, which were only brought in force in, to, in November 1st, uh, 1960, had been exercised before. Um, but yeah, so it this is something I need to clarify, but uh, where I locate the onus of uh, responsibility uh, is within the structure itself, because the argument I'm making is bigger than just uh, a, a single individual making a bad call. Uh, it's meant to be uh, indicative of the unsafety and unreliability of uh, nuclear defense infrastructure in general. Thank yes. you. Thank you. I question. I live near Fort Dix and the time of the silo explosion, we had dump trucks, I'm uh, sorry, cement trucks roaring by our farm daily. I thought that they were going to have that one uh, buried. They were going to fill the silo. They were going to get all the stuff that came out of the silo. And when they closed Fort Dix, I found out that it was still out there. And I'm saying, my gosh, this is an atomic bomb. <laughs> what, what are they doing? Where was this? The one that Fort Dix, the silo. Of okay. The, yeah. the one where they, uh, they were filling the missile and the whole thing exploded when the, there was a big leak in the silo. Blew the top off. And they went out with dump trucks and for a long time and totally filled in the, the silo, I guess. Looked around for a while around the, the silo and life continued as normal on the base until they closed the base. And then they had to certify that they cleaned it up. And they found much more stuff that was out there in the pine lands as part of Fort Dix. I see somebody shaking his head. This well, is the Bomark missile, I think you're uh, referring to. Oh, Paul. Bomark. Okay, I want the name Bomark, yeah. <laughs> there weren't too many of them that exploded, so. Now, I was a young, young guy at that time, but my father uh, was getting the excess loads of concrete delivered to the farm to put in our barnyard <laughs> because they weren't ready for it to get to the base and they had to get the truck empty. I mean, this was a big thing for us out here. And to have the loss of confidence that it took until the closing of Fort Dix a few years ago for them to get serious about looking for the mess. Uh, I'm just, no. I have no illusions about it. And I know from uh, our son getting involved with the Navy stuff that everything in that Navy book is as the man said because there's been blood spilled. Somebody didn't do it or didn't do it right. 
and I'm saying, here you go with the tower. And I'm only really hearing about the Air Force. It's 80 miles out at sea, and it's going to be built much like a ship. It's going to be crashing waves. It's going to be everything. So I was a little relieved to hear at the end that the Navy was responsible for construction. But it just looked like another big screw up there. <laughs> but thank you very much for all your research. And perhaps Alex will be able to tell me who's done the research on the Bowmark thing so we can get a talk on that one. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Paul. I'm going to have to speak with you more, um, if you don't mind, because the Bowmark is a very interesting uh, techno-political artifact. It, it led to the downfall of, uh, well, one of the reasons uh, it led to the downfall of a government uh, administration in Canada. Uh, the Diefenbaker administration was gone, and then uh, Pierre Trudeau, Justin Trudeau's dad, uh, became PM of the country, uh, and Bowmark missiles were installed. There were uh, broken arrow incidents uh, in Canada, two of them, which is, again, military lingos for some sort of uh, uh, comp a compromise to uh, a, a, a structure that contains nuclear material. Um, the, the story of the Bowmark is very interesting. Uh, I believe they say it's been fully remediated. Uh, and incidentally, all the soil has been moved to Utah, which there's an interesting story to tell there, but it's done by private contractors and I don't think I could access the archives. Um, but uh, I, I would like to learn more about it. I mean, I, like I mentioned, I have a CD-ROM with more information of anything that's declassified. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's a, a, an advocacy group for the Pineland Forest Reserve uh, yes. that has done some work on this. Um, yeah. And I, I, I recall firefighters were brought out to the site and there was a, a the military was trying to suppress some of the news getting out. Um, and it wasn't fully disclosed, I think, until the 1980s, and it occurred in uh, 1960. Yeah, well, we certainly knew about it in 1960 that it happened. Uh, I don't know about dump trucks taking dirt away. I do know about uh, cement trucks rolling down the road all day to, to take cement in. Uh, and the impression I got was that they were trying to bury it to make it safe rather than trying to clean it up. Sort of like Chernobyl. <laughs> yeah. yeah, put a dome on it. <laughs> yeah. So I look at the Google, Google Earth satellite maps of, of that and you can see the traces of, I guess I think each Bomark missile had its own launching um, structure uh, that it came out from underground and and went up and some of them appear to be flat I mean it's it's I don't know the area that well um, but it's all connected to there is a there is still a a it's not secret but it's a sort of classified military train route from that base uh, to the New Jersey or New York Harbor for the military uh, weapons. Um, they get shuttled back and forth along this this train line, which is kept completely separate from everything else in New Jersey. And I think there's an access road that you are not supposed to go on. And if you are, you will be pulled over and arrested within seconds by, I think, possibly federal uh, law enforcement um, that, that's connected to it. Well, Paul, I got to tell you, I was in, when I was in North Bay, because I'm now working in my other chapter, uh, I was able to visit uh, the former Bomark missile site, which uh, I, I believe uh, you just you can't do if you're in New Jersey because uh, <laughs> for a number of reasons. Um, you can get yeah. all around it. Yeah. It's on a base and it has McGuire, it has Lakers, it has Fort Dix. Mm -hmm. It's in the Pines. And I don't know who really searches the pines for people coming in once they're through the fence. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, no. And I know that my, my grandmother had a farm that was confiscated during World War II to become part of Fort Dix. And she used to run the milk train. <laughs> I don't know if it went to the harbor, but it was right there where the base is. 
I got to talk to you more. I'll tell you what, I mean, I, I'm committed to this dissertation. Maybe I got to hop some fences uh, to get this chapter written. But when I was in uh, North Bay, I, I visited the decommissioned uh, Bomark missile site there. Um, and it is now a self-storage facility. So what once housed nuclear warheads houses RVs and speedboats. Uh, and so it's also used for uh, filming. So it's an interesting anecdote from the Cold War cabinet of curiosities. Yes. There's also some roads built in New Jersey where the exit ramps are rather long because they had to go around a missile site. Really? And the missile site is encircled by the uh, exit ramp off the highway. Really? <laughs> yeah. Something, some things you just never know until you get much older. Yeah, I gotta go back to New Jersey. <laughs> You'll be very welcome. <laughs> Can I put a word in here, guys? By all means, Mike. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lohman. Um, I appreciate everything about the Texas Tower. Years ago, I went aboard a couple of offshore oil rigs uh, drilling for oil off New Jersey. One was the Ocean Ranger. They didn't find any oil that summer, and they picked up an anchor and went to Halifax and capsized in a big storm with the loss of all hands. That may be part of Halifax history, the Ocean Ranger. But I was on it perhaps months before it capsized. And I thought everybody went down, but apparently history says a few made it to a life raft, but when rescuers got out there, the boat was empty. So essentially they did lose all hands. I think the Ocean Ranger historically changed a lot of safety regulations on offshore rigs. That was self-propelled. It wasn't uh, a Texas Tower anchored like the Ambrose Texas Tower. Uh, but life out there is very interesting and very lonely. And you can only get out there by helicopter. So uh, I never knew about the TT4. So that's a great New Jersey history. Thank you for bringing that uh, to my attention. Uh -huh. Thank you, Mike, for bringing uh, all this historical knowledge to my attention. Uh, it's, I will I, I, tell you, another source might be the dive club that we have here in New Jersey. Okay, I need to be writing this down. Um, InfoAge is a science and history museum. It was formerly Camp Evans, part of uh, Fort Monmouth. But we now house the New Jersey Shipwreck Museum. And their room has the Texas Tower Four as one of the exhibits that they talk about. And I'm sure people in that uh, club have been out diving it and researching it. Uh, I saw their archives for uh, books and materials that they have for things. Uh, so you may find that uh, they maybe, maybe they have something too. Uh, Is this as a is it in uh, Beach Haven or is this a different one? Township. Uh, this is in uh, Wall Township near Belmar, New Jersey. Is it Belmar? Is that correct? Yeah, this is the one uh, by the ocean. There are two in New Jersey, one by Camden and one by the ocean. Uh, Wall Township is adjacent to it. Um, the whole and it was part of the Army Signal Corps during World War II, but it's now closed and it's now being made into museums. And um, the Shipwreck Museum, the New Jersey Shipwreck Museum is located there. Um, and I know that they're, one of their exhibits that they have in their room and talk about is the Texas Tower. That's fantastic. And, uh, Dan. Dan Loeb is the name, I believe, for the uh, fellow that runs that. He also has a dive shop at the beach and is involved with all kinds of stuff. Well, thank you so much. I, um, and thank you, A uh, Adriana, uh, for joining. I really appreciate it. Uh, we'll chat soon. Um, Mike, uh, you, I just want to make sure I got uh, everything you mentioned. You said the Ocean Ranger was the name of the, the oil rig? 
Yeah, they were a few of them, Ocean Ranger, Ocean uh, Victory, and the Ranger was the one that capsized off of Halifax. Uh, that's what its sister ship looks like, its self-propelled rig. That's got five legs where the towers had three. And uh, uh, I searched my records. I ran, a, I was in Scotland touring about five years ago and there's a, uh, a Siemens Training Institute uh, above uh, near Aberdeen, Scotland. And I happened to talk to an instructor <laughs> having coffee. And I mentioned I was on the Ocean Ranger. Well, he was flabbergasted. He said, we teach that in our curriculum every, every semester because of the changes in safety and the different life rafts that were not available as they are today. So uh, there is some significance, but uh, there's one chain of command on a drill ship and that's the drill captain. If you go out to service equipment, he'll keep you for a week if he wants you and then allow you to leave. So, uh, but there's, uh, the work is 24 seven drilling. It's a whole different operation, but it is offshore. And uh, uh, that's one of my experiences uh, in, in marine communications working for ITT. So I just pass that along anyway. Thanks again, uh, uh, Ms. Lohman. I hope you get your PhD very shortly. <laughs> oh, I got some time. Awesome. I'm gonna have to reach out to you, uh, Mike Shaw, if you don't mind. I um, One of the things I, I want to include in this history a little more is uh, the history of oil rigs, which is very difficult, um, just for some contextualization, it's very difficult uh, to access any primary source material about it. Um, I, I think it's important to tell at least part of that story because after all, this was called the Texas Tower uh, for a reason. Well, the one on Ambrose Channel, there used to be a light ship until the 1961 or two and they built the Texas Tower. Uh, it was manned by the Coast Guard. It had a, a beacon, a radio beacon and a light for navigating Ambrose Channel coming into New York City, New York Harbor. But it got damaged by a ship. And I think it's still standing on two legs, not three, but it's been abandoned, no longer used. But uh, there's probably a lot more on this Texas Towers what happened to one, two, and three? <laughs> this is number four. Yeah. I didn't uh, know they were trying early warning out at sea. Yeah. Uh, that, that's quite interesting in itself. Uh, two and three uh, didn't experience any issues. They were closer to shore in shallower waters and also in a, a more solid foundation uh, to be installed in. Uh, they were eventually uh, demolished and now they're, I think, popular, at least one of them is, a popular diving site. So, yeah, 180 feet. That's a recreational diver. You got to be a professional to go that deep, I think. Yeah, Texas Tower 4 is a different story. Paul Hart mentioned the historical divers. I think at our museum, Info Age, which uh, Dr. Mungram is familiar with, it's the New Jersey Historical Divers Association. And they have dived at some uh, interesting uh, wrecks. Uh, ancient ones, a submarine, a U-boat, and the Andrea Doria off of uh, Connecticut. They, they have the binnacle from that. Uh, so that's uh, uh, it's the only one I know of that's part of our museum complex, New Jersey Historical Divers. And Alex can tell you, uh, Dan Loeb is the curator. So thanks again. I enjoyed that. Uh, I enjoyed you your lecture. I will tell you, I have no qualifications and I'm not a historian. I am a docent at a different museum there. <laughs> I think anyone can be a historian. Okay, I'll take it. Well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, I, I'm happy to answer any more questions, but if there aren't any, I can, I can bring this session to a close. And Bree, can I get a URL or something for the recording? Because there are people who weren't able to come at this appointed hour and they're looking forward to a link or, or if we can post it on YouTube or however you guys do it. Uh, yeah, I, I will send that through either. 
I'll send that through uh, Google Drive. Okay. So uh, I, I'll take care of that today. I have to do some cat sitting. Like a good uh, PhD candidate, I am uh, taking care of my supervisor's cat. Ah, so right. Hopefully at the end of the day, <laughs> I'll, have it, I'll have it done. Excellent, Bree. We'll be in touch. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you all uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.